we're so pleased that you are here in God's house this morning and we want to warmly welcome anyone who's visiting that you've come out today on this cold day to be warmed and, and welcomed and loved by your fellow salvationists, by your fellow believers. It is not by accident that you are here this morning, that God wants to richly bless you as you enter into his house and you worship with him this morning. I wonder if you actually woke up this morning and asked God to bless you as you came into God's house this morning. Now, I won't ask you to raise your hands if you've done that. But it's important for us to be in a posture of receiving from God. We have to be ready because we know and we believe that he's here, right? And sometimes we come with our baggage and we come with our concerns and we come with our worries. And that's okay because God just wants us to lay it down in front of him. And he wants our minds to be open and our hearts to be open to receive. So I'm going to ask you this morning to do something a little different. I want you to turn to your neighbor, the one beside you, the one behind you. I want you to greet them in, in God's name this morning. And I want you to ask the question, are you ready to receive what God is going to tell you this morning? Can I ask you to do that now? And now, are you ready to receive and are you ready to worship God this morning with your hearts and your minds and your body in a posture to receive what he has to say? Psalm 19, verses 1 to 4 says this, Heaven is declaring God's glory. The sky is proclaiming his handiwork. One day gushes the news to the next and one night informs another what needs to be known. Of course, there's no speech, no words, their voices can't be heard, but their sound extends throughout the world. Their words reach the ends of the earth. Isn't that a beautiful image this morning? Heaven itself declares and bears witness to God's glory. And so I wonder how you have declared God's glory this week. Have people seen God's light through our lives and by our actions and by our loving of all of God's people and creation. I want us to stand together and sing this song, All Heaven Declares the Glory of the Risen Lord. Lift our voices together and sing your praise to God this morning. from the message translation this morning another psalm psalm 81 and 9 says your love god is my song and i'll sing it 
I'm forever telling everyone how faithful you are. Fairest Lord Jesus is what we're going to sing now, and it declares that he is the ruler of all nature, which is beautiful and fair. But he is fairer and more beautiful and purer than all of nature. And so as we sing this this morning, I want us to sing it as a personal testimony, will you, this morning? And as you sing, Thee will I cherish. Reflect on how you're cherishing your Lord this morning. Let's sing it together. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we welcome you into this place this morning. We have come prepared and we have opened our minds to you. And for many here this morning, there are needs, real desperate needs, whether it be loneliness, whether there are financial concerns, health concerns, and the weight of the world may be playing in their minds this morning. I just pray that, oh God, you would bring a special touch upon our lives this morning, that you would meet each individual need that is here this morning. 
And Lord, we think about those who are not able to be here this morning, those who are recovering surgery, those who are shut in, those who for whatever reason have decided that this is not where they want to be this morning. Oh God, I pray that they would know in this moment that there is healing, there is peace, there is joy, there is fulfillment in being your follower. And Lord, that you are thinking on them and that you know their needs and that you want a relationship with them and that you will meet their needs according to your riches. And so, Lord, as we worship this morning, I pray that you would be present, that we would have a tremendous filling of your spirit this morning as the word is brought forth. I pray that the anointed anointing would be on David as he speaks. And so for everything that takes place in this service, oh God, I give that back to you and pray that it would be a blessing and that it would bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I would ask the ashes to come forward now. As we receive your tithes and offerings this morning, doing so with grateful hearts, knowing that God can multiply what we give for his glory and his work here in Oshawa. We remember our band this morning who are in Fanlin Falls. You'll notice we have a, an ensemble with us and we're grateful for their uh, participation and the participation of the piano this morning. But we want to remember our band and the important ministry that they have in Fenland Falls. Let's pray. And Lord, as we give this morning, that we give from grateful hearts, knowing and being able to testify that you have graced us and, and have blessed us so many times over. And so, Lord, help us to be generous in our giving, that what we give back to you would be multiplied and used for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
yeah, it's just so much fun to sing, I want you to know. And as I'm standing there and I'm singing it, everybody sing to, to praise his name. You know, the thought I had was, I just love being part of a spiritual family. It, it, it touches my heart so much. And in that split second, <laughs> I, I shouldn't admit this to my songster leader, <laughs> rather than being totally focused on the music, my thoughts were wandering. And I was thinking about last year at, in my appointment at THQ, and we loved it. We really loved it. But in that moment, I thought, oh, God, I love being part of a regular spiritual home. This is my home. We are family. And we get to, we get to love Jesus together. Isn't that amazing? Yes, April, that is amazing. <laughs> I'm going to dismiss the children now, but I want to have a prayer of blessing over them before we send these precious little ones out. And just, um, I don't know if you, you may not even know this, but two weeks from now we're having a special service that's a focus on youth. And it's when all of our children and youth in the church, when they literally will be hijacking the service. Isn't that great? So they will be from start to finish. And uh, we're so, we're just so grateful to God for all the children. So. Let's pray for them. God, thank you. Thank you that we get to be part of a church with so many little ones. Babies, babies still coming, toddlers, school-age children, Lord, thank you for them. Teenagers, oh, what a great group of teens we have in this church. All the way up to that precious stage when they're almost full adults. God, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And Lord, we pray for an amazing blessing right now on the teachers, on the leaders, as they spend uh, the next little while pouring love into these children. And we pray, God, that we will see a whole generation of young ones growing up singing the praises of Jesus. So bless them. Let your will be done in their lives, we pray. Amen. God bless you, children, as you go out. Psalm 46. Uh, wonderful words. Let me just remind you of a few of these words. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble in the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble and the waters surge. And then verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Now often when we say, be still and know that I am God. When we're quoting that, that psalm, we imagine ourselves, uh, you know, having our quiet time. Just be still in his presence and know that he's God. But what I want to remind you from that context, Psalm 46, that these words from the Lord came to Israel when Israel was in a state of war, when there was panic, when there was chaos all around. We're, we're studying the, uh, the bait of Satan, this idea of Satan trapping us with offense. You know, I feel slighted, I feel offended. And, and I would suggest that in our chaotic world, we're surrounded by turmoil. That it's that much easier for us to fall into the traps of the enemy. Our minds are going a thousand miles a minute. We're inundated with stuff from social media, and on and on it goes. Our, our faith is attacked with these eloquent-sounding arguments. And the world continues to be a place of turmoil. And God is saying, like he said to Israel, he's saying, snap out of it, guys. That's what the, the context means here. Snap out of it. Settle down. Be still. Be still right now and know that I am God. So I'm going to ask Charles to stop playing for a second. We hadn't talked about this, but what I feel in my spirit right now is let's just have complete silence. And in the chaos, let's be still. Peace.
worship you, and I pray with the Spirit of God speaking that each of us will reflect on what that means to worship God Almighty. Here in the quietness, we're being still, and we're calling out to you, Almighty God, God of the universe, we need you. We need you intellectually, we need to study about you, we need to read your word, we need you, and we need you, Holy Spirit, to move in our hearts, to move in our emotions. Body, soul, and spirit, oh God, speak to us. I pray now as my husband comes that your Holy Spirit anointing will be upon him and we will hear your words to us today. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. This morning, and as I just strolling up to the podium here this morning, it dawned on me, I forgot to put on my headset. That's a little late to be dealing with that, isn't it? So I apologize to you um, if you've gotten used to me. Oh, there we go. Thank you very much, Mrs. McNeely. She's my favorite worship leader, I'll have to tell you. Um, it's wonderful to be in the presence of the Lord, isn't it? Yes, yes. And sometimes we feel the presence of the Lord, and at other times, uh, maybe less so. But you know, we can't just be buffeted and just swayed by feelings. We need to be sure that we are in the presence of the Lord. So I hope that you're, uh, you're feeling it, because that's always nice. But I hope that you know that you're in the presence of the Lord this morning. I've been convicted this week. I will tell you, I've been convicted this week because um, I, for, as I've mentioned to some of you, and I may even mention, have mentioned during my messages, is, is that I follow a Bible reading app called Bible in One Year. Um, B, yeah, I, I just want to be careful that I don't want to confuse it with BYOB, which is bring your own beer, those kind of parties. So, uh, it, yeah, whatever it is, it's, it's Bible in one year. There you go. And so you're supposed to work, read through the Bible in one year. Now, I was behind last year, and so I only finished last year's reading about halfway through March. And uh, so I was behind a few months. So I started reading, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I started getting caught up, and I'm almost caught up. And I'm very pleased about that. And this week, the Lord said to me, yeah, you're getting a lot of scripture read, but are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Are you actually listening to what I'm trying to tell you? And it hit me that, wait a second, it's not just about accomplishing something, it's truly listening to his voice. 
So uh, I'm so glad that you're here this morning. I'm so glad you're, and I hope you're reading scripture, but be attentive to what he has to say to you. It might just be a small little nugget. It might be something like, oh my goodness, it'll just hit you so hard and you'll think, how did I miss that? But be attentive to God's voice, which I will confess this morning is a little bit challenging because, you know, um, we were in Kingston all day yesterday, left uh, uh, yesterday morning and got back late last night. We were at a wedding um, for some people that were part of the congregation there, and it was very, very exciting. Um, You know, it was just uh, just nice to be with people that you don't see for a while and that you're, you're pleased to reconnect with, people from uh, Kingston Citadel and other friends and that. Uh, uh, so I will apologize to some of you. I didn't even get a chance to watch the hockey game last night, so I'm not even sure what the results are. That's not true. I do know who won last night, but I'm not going to dwell on that because that wouldn't be fair to you. Um, you know, Uh, getting back to something a little more serious, sometimes, you know, uh, fortunes go up and down in life, right? Whether it be our sports team, but the things that are much more important are the relationships that we have with others. Uh, And I know that many of you are uh, praying for uh, Stan Dunstan, as well as the others that uh, have health challenges in our congregation, but but you will want to know an update. Um, Stan had um, a valve replacement and also a bypass surgery on Tuesday, and um, and it turned out that it wasn't uh, it was a replacement that they had to do on the valve rather than a repair because it was just too fragile, and uh, and he is not progressing quite as quickly or as strongly as they had hoped. Um, baby steps. He's going in the right direction. Um, but I would solicit your prayers uh, for Kath and for, uh, for the family. Um, not an easy thing, right? I mean, your heart's pretty important for, uh, for the rest of life. So, uh, so actually, why don't we take a moment right now and pray for Stan. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to uh, ask you, uh, pray that you would lay your healing hand upon Stan, and uh, not only that he would sense strengthening in, his, in the flesh, in the bones, in his heart, uh, but that he, he would also uh, sense your presence this morning uh, right where he is. And also for the family, uh, we think of, uh, of David and, uh, and Mark. Um, and Lord, I just pray that you would be with uh, their wives, the families, the grandkids, uh, and just be, uh, be a strength for them and a source of peace. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning we're going to be looking at... Um, Four important principles or four important things with regards to um, offense. And, um, you know, as we progress through this series, and we're, we're over halfway, that, this is week four, um, so, um, so we're, we're kind of progressing down, and uh, I think we're really getting to the good stuff now. Um, I know I'm particularly excited about next week, um, because next week we're going to be talking about uh, forgiveness. Forgiveness, that's a tough one sometimes, isn't it? Um, and then also revenge. Ooh, that's a one that we want to stay away from, but that we are sometimes tempted by. So that's next week. So I hope that you'll, uh, you'll come back for next week's message. Um, really good stuff. And then this week we're going to be looking at uh, uh, these four, uh, four lessons that we can learn from, uh, from this book. Um, it's powerful stuff, and, and sometimes I want to just say, and I want to put the book aside, and I want to say, it's too much, Lord. It's too much. Uh, it's too heavy. I, I'm, I'm not there. I can't deal with all the things that you're showing me about my own heart, about my own life, about my own attitudes, and I just want to put it aside. I want to put it aside. Maybe you've had that feeling as well, um, that it, it's just too much. But, uh, but I think God wants us to... to wade through this. God wants us to sometimes just crawl through it, as it were, uh, because it's hard. And uh, God can do great things in our lives, even when it's hard. In fact, often because it's hard, God can do great things in our lives. Well, the first thing that I want us to talk about is uh, the fact that our foundation must be solid. Our foundation must be solid. In Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, 
Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. We've been pastors for uh, over 21 years now, and it's been an exciting journey. And you know what? It is so wonderful to be able to see how we in the church are growing as a result of the things that we're learning. And so as a result of, of all this learning and the, and the gleaning from the literature that we've read, the programs that we've followed, it is very, very easy to look at some of the things that have been tried and pro proven and have worked. But you know what? Those things are not a foundation. Only Christ can be our foundation. Only Christ can be our foundation. When we sing those worship songs and we talk about beautiful Lord, we're focusing on Christ. When we talk about Jesus is purer and brighter, we're talking about Christ. And we're bringing our attention back to what needs to be our foundation, Jesus Christ. So I hope that your foundation is Jesus Christ. And the way we do that is that we spend time in his presence. As I mentioned to you about the conviction, and one of the things that um, I felt convicted about was uh, to, uh, two things actually, to get up earlier, and uh, that's not an easy one for me, um, to get up earlier. So I committed to God. I said, okay, we'll do a little test. So I've, I've determined a certain number of days whereby I'm going to get up a little bit earlier and uh, spend time in his presence. But then also during the day to set aside at least an hour to be in the presence of the Lord. Because, you know, one of the things that has really uh, been impressed upon me over the course of the last, um, I would say, three or four years is the fact that if you as a congregation do not have a pastor or pastors that are willing to spend time with God, spending time in Jesus' presence, you have nothing. You have nothing. Oh, yes, we could have great skills, administrative skills, great preaching skills, great visitation skills, all these great skills that we could have. And yet, if I am not connected to God, if we are not, as a pastoral team, connected to God, you have nothing. Oh, we could do some good things together, but you have nothing. In fact, it's clear in John 15, apart from me, you can do, well, certain things and not others. No. Well, you can do some really, you know, some small things. No. You can do nothing. Nothing. So, I'm convicted that my foundation must be Christ. And I hope that you are convicted that your foundation needs to be Jesus Christ, spending time in his presence, reading his word, worshiping him. I hope that you are. There are a couple of things that I think we need to talk about in terms of false foundations. One of the things I mentioned already was a certain technique or certain strategies and, um, and that can be a false foundation. We kind of figured out what works, and so we're doing that, and that works. And I'm not suggesting that we throw out all technique. Not at all. Not at all. But it needs to take its proper order, its proper priority in things. And it cannot be the foundation. It needs to be part of things, part of how we do things, but it can't be the foundation. So that can be a false foundation. Our accomplishments can be false foundations. You know, that's a, that's a really tough one. That's a really tough one. Because God, we want to give God glory through the things that he's done. You know, and often, sometimes, I will talk about with different people some of the great things that have happened. There was one year in Kingston whereby there were 25 people that got saved in that one year which was unprecedented in our ministry. And so I was, I was so pleased. But that can't be the foundation. That can't be the foundation. Our accomplishments cannot be the foundation of our lives with God. The other 
tem- temptation that we sometimes have is we can be tempted to, um, to have as our foundation uh, what God can do for us, his power in our lives. So we will often pray, well, and we did this morning, we prayed that Stan would, you know, get stronger and, and be able to be healed and, and that his family would be surrounded. But, you know, God doesn't want to just be approached for what he can do for us. He wants to be approached, he wants to be worshipped for who he is, apart from what he can do for us, for who he is. So our foundation needs to be Jesus Christ not just what he can do for us or what he has done for us. An important part of this foundation is as we spend time in Christ's presence, as we abide in him, we become like him. We become like him. What a beautiful thing. My wife and I, actually, um, we, 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 you know, we have this thing whereby, you know, we, we, um, we come to a situation whereby it requires something financial from us. So it can be like an appeal for funds. Uh, it can be somebody who's approached us and asked us for money. Um, yesterday, it was uh, the wedding. And uh, so we were like, okay, how much should we give? And, uh, and she mentioned an amount, and I said to her, that's incredible. I was thinking the exact same amount. And, you know, we could wax eloquent about how God spoke to us, and, you know, and that's part of it for sure. But the other part is we've been married for, you know, almost 29 years. So you kind of get to know what the other person is starting to think, right, and, and what they're going to say. Well, that's what we want with the Lord. We want to be in his presence so that we start to know what he's thinking and what he wants. And so that we can want that as well. And we're on the same wavelength as him. Okay. The second thing, number two, sifting is for our benefit and should not be avoided. So when difficult times come or when somebody offends you and does something wrong to you, it is quite normal for your first prayer to be, God, deliver me from this. God, set me free. Bring me relief. That's completely normal. I mean, we're in good company when Jesus, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, says, if this cup could pass from me. It's a natural human fleshly temptation to want to experience relief. But... It is through the difficult times, through the challenging times, through the suffering, through the obstacles that we grow. It is through the sifting that God... Now, Jesus had this kind of dialogue with Peter, and he's talking with Peter, and he says, Oh, my, oh, my. Satan has asked that he sift you. And... Jesus doesn't respond, but it's okay. I stepped in, and you're going to be fine. No. He prays that Peter's faith will carry him through. He prays that his faith will carry him through in spite of the resistance, in spite of the difficulties. I've been trying to exercise a little bit more, as you can tell. You can't tell. Oh, sorry. So one of the things that I've been doing is I've been trying to do push-ups. I'm not even going to tell you how many I'm doing, okay, so that you can gloat and say, oh, my goodness, wow, you're pretty good for a beginner, or whatever you're going to say. Impressed or not impressed, it doesn't really matter. Um, But, you know, one of the things about this is, is that I could do push-ups while I'm standing and doing it against the wall. I suppose they wouldn't really be called push-ups. They would be called push-outs, I guess. But, uh, But I wouldn't really get much benefit from it, would I? Because I'm not experiencing any resistance against my muscles. And I need to build up my muscles 
So it's through the resistance time, through the obstacles, through the difficult times, through the things when you're not sure how to respond that you're going to grow. Through your sifting, God is going to bring you to a place of holiness and purity before him. So we must not, even though the temptation may be to avoid the sifting, we must not seek to avoid it. I think an important thing in this is to understand God and how he understands us. Um, sometimes, I, one of the things I weighed myself last night, and um, no, it wasn't last night, the night before last, and I said to April, I said, you never know, you never guess how much I weigh. And so I, I told her how much I weigh. God knows how much I weigh. God knows the number of hair on my head. God knows the things that are really bugging me, the things that I feel really great about. God knows all the things from the past. He knows all the things from the future. He knows my right now. He knows exactly where you are. He knows how strong you are, how weak you are. And he knows exactly how far to push you. Oh, you may think it's beyond what you should be pushed. In fact, I suspect that you will think that. And that's a good sign. But God knows exactly, and he won't push you beyond what you can handle with his help, with his help, right? So we can trust him. We can trust him. And that's not always easy, right? Because, I mean, we are confident in our own abilities. We're like, okay, I've, I've got this, you know? And uh, so we, we are confident, and God sometimes wants to, break down our pride. I know that that happens to me sometimes, and, and he humbles me, and I, and I think, oh, goodness, did you have to do that in public, Lord? You know, but God sometimes wants to humble us because he wants to break down our pride, and so that we're not depending on ourselves, but we're depending on him. Number three, Jesus will offend us. Well, I, you know, when I first read this, I think, wait a second, that offends me. I mean, Jesus is, is wonderful. Jesus is kind. Jesus is loving. Jesus is, is, is you know, is wanting my best. And, and Jesus, all these wonderful different things. But, you know, sometimes we need to be offended. Sometimes he needs to just give us a little... Nudge. Well, sometimes it's a little bit more than a nudge for some of us. Sometimes it's a little bit of a swift kick, as my father or mother used to say. But we don't necessarily like that because it offends us. But, you know, we're in good company. Who did Jesus offend? Well, um, he offended his family. They were like, he's just one of us. Why is he talking like this? He offended the people that he hung around with and was, was designed to, to disciple. What does he say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Well, I would imagine Peter was a little offended by that. Jesus said that to you. I think that would be a little offensive to you. But even better yet, he offended the people um, that were closest to him that were closest to him. Mary and Martha. And man, his timing was really bad. Like if you think about it, they're grieving. And he comes and he says, you know, don't worry about it. Chill. Talk about insensitive. These were his best friends. They just lost a loved one, a brother. And Jesus offends them. But I think the one that I like the most and that I hate the most is the fact that he really called to task and offended the Pharisees. I think on the one hand, I like it the most because I think, yeah, they had it coming to them. They were all about religion and laws and, and all those rules. Yeah. They had it coming to them. Give it to them, Jesus. And then on the other hand, I realize 
that I'm pharisaical sometimes as well. And I focus on the visual. I focus on the laws. I focus on the rules. But God focuses on the heart. And God sometimes wants to offend me in my pharisaical attitude sometimes because he wants to do a work in my life. He does. He does. And he wants to do a work in your life as well. And then the fourth one, there's two scriptures that I have up there. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And then also Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. God doesn't give us freedom or show us things so that we can beat other people over the head with them. He wants us to live by example. He wants us to live in a spirit of humility and gentleness. God extends grace and frees us from our offense to be servants. To be servants. So I was telling you we went to this wedding yesterday. And uh, one of the, uh, I was asked to do a devotional before the dinner. And so I shared um, from, uh, from Ephesians 5, uh, which talks about um, wives submit to your husbands. I love that passage. Men, don't you like that passage? Yeah, but the part, the verse just before it, which is still part of the passage, grammatically speaking, they've proved it all, is submit, therefore, to one another. So if ever you hear the reading of that scripture without that verse in it, think, uh-oh, there's somebody that's cutting and splicing where they shouldn't be cutting and splicing. Submit, therefore, to one another. And then there's the later part in the passage which talks about how husbands love your wives as Christ gave himself for the church. And I'm thinking, oh, man, Jesus died on the cross for the church. And that's a hard one for me because I want to be about me. Everything within me screams about me. But everything about God and his example and his model is be a servant. Be a servant. And you know what the beautiful thing about being a servant is, is that it's very different from being a slave. Some of you might feel in your marriages that you're slaves. That uh, Don't raise your hand. It's not necessary to do that. Um, that you may feel like you're forced or you're being manipulated into a certain type of behavior. And that's slavery. You are required. But what is the difference with a servant? A servant has decided, has chosen to serve the master or has chosen to serve. How many of us are very good at serving other people? Now, I'm not talking about working in the kitchen, you know. Um, my wife is a wonderful servant to me. She does most of our cooking. It's wonderful. She's an excellent cook. Wonderful. And I serve her back by quite often doing the dishes. In fact, I brought it to her attention. Maybe some of you could approach her about this. I'm a little concerned uh, because I'm quite... Quite frankly, I'm not brave enough to do so. Um, but it's, you know, I sometimes, I'm trying to cook a little bit more. But, you know, it's our poor daughter, Miriam. She's suffering as a result. Um, but that's okay. That's okay. I think we'll, we'll get there eventually. So I, I do the cooking. But I said to her the other day, I said, you know, I've noticed that when I do the cooking, I still seem to be on for the dishes. Anyways, I will leave that to you. And, uh, and how the Lord leads you to speak to her. Or maybe you're going to speak to me and say, you know what, that's God teaching you how to be a servant. <laughs> I don't know. But I'm not talking about those practical things, and they are important. But I'm talking about the attitude of our hearts. Because when somebody asks for something, it's not going to be convenient for you at that time necessarily. When God asks you to do something, it won't necessarily be at the time that you would choose. It will be at the time that he chooses. And you will be invited 
to serve him in that regard or to serve your brother or your sister in that regard. It's an attitude of the heart. So on all these things, we must be steadfast. On all these things, we must be steadfast. Now, our temptation is going to be to, okay, you know, I got to really be attentive to the Lord. And when he, you know, presents a situation to me, I'm going to have to say, Lord, you know, okay, I can do this. If that's your attitude, I think you're going to be lost most of the time. Your decision to follow and to obey what the Spirit says has to be before then. You have to come to the place whereby you say, Lord, your spirit is going to show me things, and I know some of them are going to be difficult for me to do. Some of them are going to be difficult for me to follow, but I want to commit right here, right now, to do what you're asking me to do. The attitude of our hearts. Committing to do what God would have us do. We're going to have a time of worship now, and... uh, And I pray that the Lord has spoken to you this morning. It's always wonderful uh, to to hear from you when you're going out the door, if I happen to be at the door, or if you come to me, or or sometimes send a little message, an email, or or some kind of message, you know, and and talk about what God um, has revealed to you or something that he's shown to you. And, And it's always so... funny, but also humbling that some of those things seem to have nothing to do with the message. Because God's Spirit speaks. Irregardless of what I might say up here, He's speaking this morning. And I hope, like I said at the beginning, that you've been listening to His voice, attentive to His voice. As we sing this worship song, I pray that Indeed, um, you will have the response of surrendering to God before you even know what he's asking of you. Surrendering to him because he is good and loving and kind. Lord, I come to you.
say this uh, power of God's love is so profound and so important. You know, all these principles that my husband shared this morning, and over all of it that I heard from God speaking through David, is if we're not rooted deeply in this love, experiencing this love, then we keep on trying to do something. So it's a rainy Sunday out. We're not in a hurry, right? There's nowhere to go. Just kidding. In this presence of the Holy Spirit right now, I want to say again to you, if you know, you're here and you know that you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, then the Word of God asks us to, to actually confess with our mouth that he's Lord. There's a sense of making it very public. Then I want to invite you to come and kneel at the altar. And we're going to meet with you and pray with you so that you can surrender your life to Jesus today. If, if you're a, a follower of Jesus, but you want to mark today with a, a time where you're saying, God, I need to experience more of this powerful love, then you come up and either kneel at the altar, signifying to us that you want someone to pray with you, or like we say, if you want to come but you don't need someone to pray with you, then you come and stand or kneel around the holiness table, and we'll leave you there in God's presence. But let's get this piece right. The power of God's love, experiencing this power, this is what changes everything. So we're going to sing it again as God does his work here. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be
is so good. Charles, play that again. I'm going to pray with you, and the band can come and take your place. God, thank you for your love. Thank you that you are here with us, that you see us. You see my brothers, my sisters. And you know what we're carrying. You know the joy and the longing and the hopes. And you know the heaviness. And you see us with great delight as your sons and your daughters. God, may we walk into that and, and feel that and understand that. You are, you are God of the universe and we are your sons and your daughters. So God, let this sense of your love be powerful upon us. We love you and we worship you in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You can stay seated. I mean, standing <laughs> or be seated. The band ensemble is going to come up and we're going to have a wonderful uh, closing song singing to our great King of Kings as we get ready to go out this morning.